Good evening, guys, and thanks for coming out to this January edition, 2022, of uh, Classic Car Restoration Club Q&A. Uh, again, I'm joined with Ross Keel and Terry Wright. Uh, ready to answer all your questions. Feel free to just nail us, you know. Uh, our, our challenge today is to stump Terry. Uh, <laughs> Terry is a, is a automotive paint professional, so we're gonna. Good evening, you know, guys, and thanks for coming whoa. out to this January wait, 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 wait. edition, 2022. I've of, got two uh, classic car restoration club Q and A. I've got uh, I've got to mute myself here. There we go, guys. Um, the uh, to get right into it. Uh, before we get right into it, there's a. Right down below here, guys, there's a box. Troubleshoot a hard brake pedal uh, PDF. You know, it, it's free. All you have to do is, you know, click on the link, you know, and, you know, follow the process. You'll get, uh, you'll get a nice free download, a little extra for you tonight. Uh, so take, make sure you take a look at that. You know, anything that's freeze, we're saving up for. The uh, our, our first question, though, tonight comes from Richard. Richard, thanks for getting your question in early. Appreciate it. Uh, and Richard writes, hello, how difficult is it to change out the body mounts on my 73 Pontiac Ventura? And where to get the best direct fit parts? For thanks, X body, X body be the the term for the Novas, the Nova Ventura Omega Apollo is the four. Huh? huh? How they oh, do yeah, that? Yeah, Named all the X bodies. Not bad. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, oh. the the uh, the X body cars use this a uh, lot of the same mounts and stuff as the F bodies, and we have our resident F body expert Terry, who has just restored a beautiful looking '68 Firebird. Terry, how hard is it to change up? Mm, they're through? actually pretty easy. It's just the subframe mounts, really, and um, so on that there'd be six, two or uh, four for the body, and then two for the core support. Um, they're not that hard to do, and I think we've talked about it before in the past about how, uh, how to go attack it, but um, don't do them all at the same time, right? Do maybe one side. One or, side at a time, yeah. Loop, you know, and then, yeah, unless you're, unless you're planning to remove your whole subframe, you can do them one side at a time and, um, and loosen up the opposite side a little bit so you can actually get a little flex to so raise, raise it up. It you don't bit. have to raise it up a lot, really, to get those uh, mounts in there. No. Um, <clears throat> it's possible that they're rusted in there pretty good. So yeah. if you have access to the top side, uh, you could put a little penetrating oil down down on the studs. Mm -hmm. The ones on the cowl, you can get two for sure from down the engine compartment. You can see those. But the inside of the car, you can, I think they're right about where the seat tracks are. There's a hole that you can see the bolts come up. Mm -hmm. You can, you can put some penetrating oil in there. If it's rusty, if it's, you're not in the Northern state, maybe you won't have a problem with it, but um, <laughs> yeah, you don't have to lift it up too far. Really. There's just a little tiny lip that goes in the, in the frame mm -hmm. from the bushing. You just have to get up out of it and yep. pull it out. Yeah. And I think a lot of guys, you know, a lot of guys are real nervous about taking the body mount bolt out. And, you know, I know even even on this car right behind us here, uh, the, the when I, I, you know, we had even though we had gone through the process to uh, to restore the whole car when it came time to, uh, you know, put the you know, put the final tires and wheels on and everything else. Suddenly we realized that, like, the body was not square on the frame. And it was like holy smokes because it, it was you know, the fender, the tires were almost rubbing on one side, and on the opposite side we had like tons of extra room. And it was like, all right, we got to do something. So we undid all, we loosened up all of the body mount bolts. It was still, it's a full frame car, so mm -hmm. it's not like a Nova or, or um, yeah, that's gonna go like where you have, where loosen. you don't want to loosen all the bolts and have the car like suddenly scissors down. You still want to, you know, like a Nova or a subframe or a unibody car. You want to make sure your body is still supported. Yep. 
before you jack every, you know, start loosening everything up because you don't want to create problems. But like in this case, you know, we we were able to loosen up every, all the, you know all the body bolts and then shift you know using some stra ratchet straps, we mm -hmm. shifted the body over just enough and then tightened everything back up, and now it's like perfect side to side. And it's like you know those little things that a lot of guys don't think about, and we didn't think about it right away. And it was like, well, now we're now we're all done, and it was like, no, we're messed up. So. You know, a little, taking a little time to, you know, make sure not only the body mounts are right, but everything square on the body is a good idea. Yeah. I, I guess if it's a part, um, like when I did my Firebird, I took the whole, you know, I separated the subframe and body. But if it's a part on those, on mine, and I would imagine it on there too, there'll be, a, uh, there'll be alignment holes in both the frame, the unibody, and mm -hmm. the body mount where, like when they assembled, there were just pins that went up in there for alignment. Mm -hmm. That was just like alignment, and then they run the bolts tight. So, um, and then they maybe do some cross measurements from there if they had to. But um, when I put my back together, I just ran those things right back up a line, and I didn't do anything other than that. And in a line, no problem. Hmm. They, the, I think leaving the, wheel. the bolts on one side also helps. I mean, well, if, yeah, you, you wouldn't have to worry about that if you left bolts on one side. But if it was a separate, you just make sure those are aligned. I think it'd be no problem at all. But yep. um, I mean, if it's if your front sheet metal is on, you're probably not going to do that. You're, you're going to leave it all together, probably. Yeah. I would guess. But um, loosen them all up. I would loosen them all up for sure. Mm -hmm. um, I've had to, this last year when I had to take, uh, I had to get at my, my Muncie tranny and I had to get the cross member out of the way. I actually, it was so tight in there. I actually had to loosen up the back bolts just to get that subframe to drop uh -huh. a little bit mm -hmm. to move that sideways to get it out. Okay. And so don't worry about unloosening it up yeah. as long as something's still aligned. Something's still attached. Yeah. 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 We need to do that on my Chevelle someday, by the way. Yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's off. We, we've been after Ross to, uh, you know, get his body straight on the frame for a long time. Uh, but, uh, you know, for some reason, he's been a little hesitant. Actually, the best time would have been when we had the whole carpet out of it. And we could yeah, have it would have been easily really nice. accessed all the bolts. Before we put all the insulation in. In the dynamat and everything mm -hmm. else. Now we've got a whole bigger project to do. <laughs> 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 all right, we won't get into that. Yeah, we don't want right. to that far off. That's what it was. <laughs> Our next question comes from Jay. He writes, uh, I'm updating a prior restoration where the inner coating is flaking away on parts. Parts of the frame and the underside, uh, exposed metal is rusted. Common as it starts to start flaking off and rusting. Um, but no holes. What's the best approach to fixing this? I would, you know, I, uh, I'll, I'll pipe up first and I know that, you know, Terry, our coding expert is going to have an opinion, but I would like mainly get the, get, you know, go, you, if you've already got undercoating in, you don't want to strip it all off unless right. you're doing a complete restoration, but I would like go after the loose rusted areas and I would make sure that I wire brush those or clean those up. I would then, if I would check for any other loose or flaking undercoating, and if it, you know, if indeed it's undercoated, I would then at that point, you know, you can prime or, you know, you can prime or undercoat at point at that point to seal it up, seal up the surface. Go ahead. Mm. Well, I guess it depends on how far you want to go to it. Do you want to just kind of fix up what's what's there, what's mm -hmm. exposed, or do you want to kind of dig into it deeper? And because if it, if some of it's peeling off, how much more is going to be peeling right. off? And yeah. what's underneath it? Is it did they just undercoat over bare metal? Mm -hmm. Which is probably not the best thing to do. But um, I guess at the very minimum, if you want to clean up what you got there, clean up the rust as much as possible. But what about um, using something like 415 over it? Oh, I mean, yeah. You could use something yeah. like that. A rust converter. Yeah, and and, yeah. and that might be a good quick kind of a, you know, if that's as far as you want to go. That so might use, use like a like a 415 rust converter and yeah. then, then go back and maybe seal and then put some other coat right over the top. top over you wouldn't even notice it probably. Yeah. Um, Clean it up first. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Wire brush it. 
Yeah, well, you know, I don't think with 415, I don't think you want to take too much rust off. I think no, they want no, some yeah, rust you off. Want, you don't want a bare metal. You want it to actually convert the rust yeah. uh, with a lot of those rust conversions it's attached to it. it. It wants some rust there, but you want to get rid of loose and flaky stuff. Right. Yeah. That's what I meant by wear ruin it. If it was clean metal, I'd want to epoxy it. I'd epoxy it and then press boot or undercoat over the top of it again. Some rubberized undercoating is, I'm guessing, what's coming off. Yep. But so. I would epoxy bare clean metal. Um, but if it's rusty and it, 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 the easy route would be that poor 15. That, that it actually works. works. It works. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, I mean, that's that's an option. But to do it, if you if you want to go that route and you want to get the frame clean, then epoxy it and then undercoat it after that, I'd say. Yeah. Same with the underbody. Yeah. And, in, in the, you know, it's my own personal preference. I use, and I, I, I have I have a disdain for restored cars with undercoating under them, and that is just me. You know, it's just my just because I've seen so many cars where the owners have cheated the restoration and did kind of a you know a crappy job of repairing floorboards and stuff like that, and down to even using like foil duct tape and then spraying over it with undercoating to hide it you know and when you get a thick layer of undercoating it's you know it look at a glance underneath it looks good so i'm always yeah. real wary of cars what's with it hiding <laughs> yeah what what's hiding underneath all that i just so. spray all that well then don't look underneath my car <laughs> <laughs> um, so you're saying you undercoated your car. well i use the no cleanup uh, uh yeah some 3M no cleanup uh, yeah. undercoating on it. And it was, I epoxy everything first. I had to clean it all up, I epoxy mm -hmm. everything nice and black. I could have left it like that, mm -hmm. but I wanted a little bit of, you know, give me a little bit, a little of, bit of road protection. You know, I, I realize there's a, a real reason why people use it. It's a little just... sound denning too. And I really coated my wheel wells for rocks. You can watch them in there. Pictures. I got pictures. I got pictures of a bear. <laughs> I got pictures of what I'm hiding. So that's okay. We'll let you go on that one. Yeah. Well, I nothing, know saying, if nothing yeah. else, you could, you, you know, there's an advantage to taking pictures. So if you, when it does come time to resell, <laughs> that you know, you can show that you weren't hiding anything. No. You know, so. Um. Okay, we have a question coming in. Looks like off of Facebook. I guess this is a '69 Charger. I'm getting tired of charging. Of I'm getting tired of the charging system. Want to go with a one-wire alternator? Is there a quick fix with existing with the existing alternator, or should I just buy a one-wire alternator? Um, in the '69, they have well, they, um, and, and I admit not being real familiar with the '69 mm -hmm. Mopar. Uh, I know the '69 Mopar has a unique charging system. The Mopars of that era have unique charging systems that, are, that have all kinds of unique issues to them. Do I think a one if if you just want flat out reliability, a one wire alternator is awesome. Uh, I'm not aware of one of a Mopar variant of the one wire alternator. Usually it's the GM, although I did see there's a Ford one wire alternator out there now. Um, but you know, it, it, it's not about what, who is the manufacturer of the alternator. It's about, you know, having a good reliable alternator that has a self energizing, um, voltage regulator in it. Mm -hmm. That's usually, you know, that's the difference between a one wire and a multi wire GM alternator is that, uh, the one wire has a self energizing voltage regulator in it. So the system itself energizes itself, itself so it'll produce the uh, the voltage. The mm -hmm. uh, chargers, I believe, have a three wire voltage regulator on a firewall. Yeah, have the, yeah. It's it's a little more complicated. Yeah, it's system. a little more complicated. And, I, and I'm going to show my real ignorance <clears throat> with the Mopar electrical like systems a... and and. Well, I, I, you know, I, I, am a friend of all makes, uh, you know, I, I've owned them all. I, I don't, I'm not always familiar with each one intensely. Something we can ask Jeff. Yeah. 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 I can't help you with that at all. <laughs> <laughs> but if you want to paint it, Terry's got some advice. Yeah. The, uh, um, 
Yeah, uh, you know, uh, for me, my best best bet would be, you know, go with yeah, go with a one wire alternator. They uh, you'll save yourself a whole bunch of headache because there, there's that sep- there's not only is there alternator, there's the, the separate control box or whatever mm-hmm. that's usually back, mounted back on the firewall. Yeah. And I know there's a bunch of issues associated with that. If we got some Mopar guys out here, yeah. go ahead, pipe in. You know, we like to hear from your opinions too. So if we got any diehard Mopar guys listening tonight, you know, you got some advice, go ahead and join in, and yeah, and, and we'll gladly accept your uh, prowess as well. The next Isaiah writes, he has a '67 Cadillac sedan Deville. And he can't get my back two doors to open. How, how can I get them open? Um, if I can get the if I can get the windows to roll, I can't get the windows to roll down either. Thanks in advance. And wow. and I there <laughs> there is some issues on some and some of these Cadillacs of that era there's some issues with the, the you know because the fancy car they have lots of rods that control the the latching mechanism and I've heard of guys having issues with these before where the you know the rod falls off and suddenly you can't open it from the inside and the outside deal isn't working I've heard of guys that have, you know, it, it's a bear, but I've heard of guys that go in and, you know, pull the door panels off with the door closed, which is not an easy thing to do um, to actually get to that locking mechanism. Actually, if you go online, you're going to find a whole host of people complaining about, uh, you know, if you put like doors won't open, you know, 67 Cadillac. You're going to find all kinds of people with the same problem. And and I've heard everything from, you know, have somebody stand outside, hold the button while somebody inside, you know, uses the base of their foot to lay on the seat and hammer against, you know, kick against the door panel. So it'll like hopefully free up. Uh, it's it's a known issue with those. Uh, in the latch. And, and yeah, I've heard it, it's, and mainly it's just, if you do get it open, make sure you have new latches and new rods and clips and everything before you close that door again. It's a known issue and take the inner door panels off. I know of guys that have gone through all the work of even, you know, prying doors open and and pulling out door panel from the inside and cutting away stuff to get to that latch mechanism it's a known issue it's a problem there's not an easy fix if we have any cadillac guys out here tonight and you do have an easy fix for this i'm all ears because i've heard of this more than once especially on cadillacs of this era where they can't get the doors open yeah, I've run it a few times working in body shops where I can't get the doors open and I've had to take off door panels from the inside. It's not the easiest thing to do. You can do it. It's mm-hmm. not easy. And you might wreck some things along the way, but if that's the only way you can get in. The latch, probably the latch on that is probably seized up somehow, somewhere, because if yeah. both inside and out doesn't actuate the latch, right. it's probably the latch where it's around the striker. Um you know, I, I guess it. You know, both back doors don't do it. Wow, oh, it just kind of tells me that latch just seized up and corroded up. But um, I mean, I've heard of guys get finally getting inside and taking, well, whether it's a an Allen or someone worse star, uh, probably sixty seven would be Allen Rich, but on the on the striker, loosening it up and pulling it out and able to get the door open with the striker and the latch still. Hmm. Not the easiest, but some of them are open where you can actually get it and move it on enough. Yeah, depends on the, you know the washers yeah, might it, fall off. You know, I I know it's a known issue with these, and and it's not the first time anybody's asked about it. Um, like I like I say, you know, I I encourage you. You know, I've heard like a million different solutions how to do it. Uh, 
go online uh, and, and, and kind of look out there, you'll find a lot of people with the same problem and all of them have done different processes to get to it. I, you know, I've heard, you know, I've heard of people going through it much more extreme means to try to get them off too, but I'm not going to sit here and encourage you to do Stuck severe damage to your car, but you, you know, uh, it, it can be done, but, uh, most likely you're going to have to get the door panel off mm -hmm. from the inside in order just to access anything. Yeah. And if, if you get to that point and it is your latches that are all froze up, maybe get some, uh, PV blaster or penetrating oil in there on your latches, on inside, just start soaking it soak yeah. and then trying to work it. Yep with the rods that are there it's if it's seized up it's possible like you said the rods came right off the little clips and, and you'll be able to figure that out right away if they're flopping around the breeze but yeah um yeah it sounds like the latches are are kind of froze up on it and they it's not easy but it can be done you can, can do it it can be and you those cars are a little bit bigger you'd love more room to roll around <laughs> the back seat so <laughs> you have a lot more room to to, no, to work in there try to get your seat out first too i mean you give you more yeah, yeah it, it does help uh okay. you know i have had i've had it happen once done one cadillac once where i was able to just have somebody lifting on the on the handle outside and then i just sat kicked with my yes. foot right in a nice solid a area yeah. near the latch area with you know and, and it did free up i did pop and then it was like oh thank god you know then you know and as soon as it was all open we could disassemble everything easy uh, but you know yeah it like i say it's a known issue with those era of cars of especially cadillacs for some reason mm -hmm. um okay john writes what's the best long lasting coating to put on my cast iron exhaust header exhaust header that won't burn off i'm thinking the exhaust manifold that won't burn off because they're cast iron mm -hmm. um won't burn off too quickly um i you know for it it, it all depends it comes down to you know how your engine's running too mm -hmm. so you know we have so a we have on. a we have a friend of ours who is has his headers painted bright blue and every time we look open the hood you look at him go why are these still bright blue <laughs> yeah they are they look like they just painted them <laughs> but you know, whereas any header I've ever had, it all burns off real soon after that. The uh, mm -hmm. uh, on cast iron, there, there's not a lot of things that really work. Usually, the things I found, you know, if you if you go out on the site, we also have a video on using graphite spray. Uh, graphite has a very it it's it's not going to be a coating really. It's just you know it's it's more <laughs> more of a cover up than anything else. But you, you can spray like a dry a dry graphite spray on your exhaust manifolds, and it also works on on uh, master cylinders because sometimes you get that big red rusty master cylinder, and it just looks trashy on a, a beautiful show car. And if you just spray some of that graphite spray on it, and you can even rub it in, and it gives it kind of a cast irony look to it. And it also works on exhaust manifolds. Is it going to last? The season no you're probably gonna have to touch it up Go once it. a month yeah. or something and and you can spray that graphite that dry graphite spray on a rag and wipe the wipe your exhaust manifolds with that if there's you know that's that's what i've done in yeah. the past so i haven't had any luck with keeping anything on no. exhaust manifolds no. and even on my on pontiac heads the ports kind of come out from the head mm -hmm. and kind of start the good luck eating paint on those right. it's just right. the worst thing um, but I do know some of the guys that use uh, some long branch manifolds and Pontiacs will get them ceramic coated, mm -hmm. and that does. And, and you can get different colors in that too. You can get kind of like a cast look. Yep. You can get them silver. Yeah. Um, that seems to hold up pretty good. You know, ceramic really coating. Well. What's that? Get aluminum heads. Aluminum heads. <laughs> you talking about me? <laughs> That's what I tried. I don't. I don't believe they came with that. <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 well, there are the you know like the HPC coating, the jet, the, the jet hot coating, yeah. and some of those. 
You know, it's not like powder Better coating. Powder coating will not last. Do not powder coat your exhaust manifold because powder coating is just plastic. Uh, but there are some there are some high temperature coating like you know uh, that are available that you know you, they'll blast. You know, where you can there are companies where you can just send out your exhaust manifolds and they'll mm -hmm. uh, they'll blast them and and coat them with that. Um, it's not cheap. Uh, they're also, you know, if you, they're real old stuff, they used to porcelainize the exhaust manifold. Um, and that's not cheap also. Okay. It's really expensive and, and, and that's harder to find. But a lot of people, you know, the, if you're dead set on doing something, some of the HPC coatings, so, you know, the, the real performance high heat coatings will and you know, we'll get the job done. But most of those you can't do yourself. You're going to have to send it somewhere to have it done. Um, and that's, that's about what I'm aware of, other than, you know, like using graphite spray, which I use on my car. Mm -hmm. And again, it's not it's not going to last the season, but it'll, it'll go two, three, four weeks, and then, you know, Gosh, I can was... touch it up and... You know, it, it depends on, you know, what I'm going to be doing with the car. I'm going to be showing it someplace wherever you want it to look really nice. Or if it's just a regular cruise nights and stuff, I don't need to get it looking. I and mean, if it's like a Pontiac, you don't see them anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you got to be so hurtful? <laughs> well, they're underneath. Uh -oh. <laughs> I'm saying I, you know. The okay, before not, these guys degrade this them. into a Pontiac versus Chevrolet uh, <laughs> argument, the... Uh, Stuart writes, uh, good day from Australia. Yeah, yeah. yeah hey. I don't wonder. I didn't um, know they were open. <laughs> love, these, love these sessions. Thanks, guys. I'm building up a Ford XB Ute. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I and I've gotten I've gotten heat for calling Utes El Caminos before. So um uh, with, ooh, with a 351 Clevo. Okay, so it'd be a Ranchero then. Uh, I have a complete new engine rebuilt. It has a high performance water pump, oversized radiator, a new thermostat, but it still heats up too much. Also, have a, a Gilmer kit fitted. Oh, now you're, Stuart, you're going to have to help us out here again. A Gilmer kit. Uh, any suggestions? Um, <clears throat> I had okay. Um, it looks like you've you know you've you've put in a high performance water pump. You've put in an oversized radiator and a new thermostat. Uh, it still heats up. Um, you know, I have a I have a. 35 Chevy that has a, a big motor in it and a little skinny radiator. And I used to always have problems with that sucker overheating every time I took it out. And uh, so you usually had to keep moving. You didn't want to get stuck in a parade yeah, or anything. Like that. So, or... Yeah, so then, so when I rebuilt that car years ago, I says, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to make this car run cool. So the first thing I did was I went with the thickest radiator I could fit in there. And then I added a shroud. And, you know, the, the benefit of adding a shroud can't be overstated enough. Exactly. Uh, uh, years ago, I was in a radiator manufacturer plant. And they were showing me an actual uh, thermal image of a radiator with just a fan running behind it. And you could see where they had a ring near the outer edges of the fan blade where it was cooling, it was getting maximum cooling, but the rest of the radiator was still running hot, including in the middle of it. And that's because that that's was the, just the fan, just the outer edge of the fan blades were the only thing moving air through. And, so, and then they showed the same radiator, same fan set up shrouded. As soon as you add the shroud, it forced the air all through yeah. throughout the whole radiator, and the, the thermal image of the radiator dropped, went from just being a ring to being virtually the same all the way across, just by adding a shroud. So having a good shroud is important. He got back to us. He's got electrics. 
Yeah. Oh, okay. Two thermal fans. No fan on the crank, but two thermal fans fit it. Must okay. Be yeah, and and if you got two thirty, you know, even you know, that's uh, my thirty five Chev that has two electric fans on it. Um, those are it, it has a bigger shroud, and uh, that allows for you know, even though I got two fans pulling, I got two sixteen inch fans on the radiator on top of one another, and they're both pulling, but it's also shrouded. Uh, I can now take that car and idle around in 90, 100 degree heat, and, and the, uh, the, thermo the thermostat never goes over 190. I think I have a 180 therm or thermostat in there, but the temperature never goes over 190. It stays cool. I can, you know, put around the fairgrounds. I can, you know, go in, go in a parade or into heavy traffic without any concern. I can't stress enough, make the car run cool. Do whatever it takes to make it run yeah. cool. And I was going to ask him too, did it, does this from day one, you know, after you got it rebuilt, you know, because head gaskets, I mean, if they for some reason are not ported the same way as, you know, obviously your heads and your block. Mm -hmm. I mean, is this one from day one, it ran hot. Did it run be hot before, you know, before you got it rebuilt because it shouldn't run hot with that. What he's the combination he's got there. Yeah, if he's got, uh, he's got no fan on the crank, but he's got two thermal right. fans fitted, so he's got two electric fans. You know, yeah, yeah and uh, again, shrouded. Uh, yeah, you should have a shroud. I mean, definitely there. should have a shroud. Definitely, if he's got a big fan that there, big, you know, make sure your, you know, uh, your. Your fans are, you know, I like I, with mine, I, I got the biggest or the most cubic feet per minute I could get in that size. We'll so, source. You must not have a shroud. No. Yeah, so we'll source or build a shroud. Uh, thank you, Mark. We'll source. Uh, yes, from day Mark. one, he said. So that's kind of yep, a question. Yes, too. from day one, yeah. And yeah, if he doesn't have a shroud on her, that's the first thing I would add. I did uh, not previously, though. Yeah. See, that's the kind of question yeah. I would check flow. from the rebuild. Yeah, if if he didn't previous, well, if he if he had the same motor in there, right? But head gaskets, if you put obviously you put new head gaskets and if you rebuild it, yeah. I mean, if it has for some reason has a wrong head gaskets, it's not flowing. Mm -hmm. It's going to run hot. I mean, that is scary. Way well, you know, well, yeah, I I hate it when like you know you rebuild an engine and suddenly you have right. new problem. Yeah. Um. I can share our experience with, and I'm going back to my Firebird view only because that's what I know and deal with. And, and many Firebird owners have had a problem with heating. Pontiacs are notorious for mm -hmm. overheating. And, and for Pontiacs, it has to be, it has to do with some clearancing with the divider place and the pump. And, and that's a lot to do with it. But on the higher performance cars, not only, well, there's shrouds on them. But not only that, they have baffles ahead of the radiator, mm -hmm. above and below to direct all the air coming in to go through the radiator yep. and a lower air dam to get it up in there. So if there's if you can tunnel air into the radiator, that would help. Instead yeah. of just pulling air from around it, you know, you're sure. Or are you pulling or pushing your air? You know, well, you're gonna do both. So the fans are gonna pull it, but your if your hands are on the outside. Oh yeah, yeah. Yep. You, know, you really don't. I mean, surely, then it wouldn't. Then it wouldn't matter. Yeah, I, no. I, I understand what you're saying there, but um, some 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 baffling would help or could yeah. help possibly. I don't know what it. I think the Cleveland is a. They do have a, you know, a spacing difference because they have a. I'm trying to think because their their water pumps bolt into a same thing. Yeah, yeah. Yep. So there's divider plates that roll yes. the water yes, from. That's what I was so if the impeller is too far away from those divider plates, it sits there and cavitates. Mm -hmm. Yep. It won't move water. It bypasses. Yeah, yeah. So there's like in the potty, you have to take them out and hammer them down. You can actually just hammer them to get them closer to the right. to the um, impeller, and that seems to help a lot of the Pontiac issues. But I don't know. You got a brand new water pump. I would think that it would be, yeah, you know, it, where it, it needs to be, but not necessarily. Yeah. You can put a brand new water pump on a Pontiac and have the same problem. Uh, also, you know, with your thermostat, a lot of guys will, you know, a lot of the performance guys like to drill eighth inch holes or whatever, uh, 
around the the base so you're still getting flow even when it's closed yeah um Less and to help get chance. get the air out of there too yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. um yeah, yeah that's a question i mean maybe you should ask is um you know when you open your radiator you get a good flow you know i mean yeah you should be able to see if, a flow if your head gaskets aren't flowing good water through it I mean, I wouldn't think you'd have very good flow through that radiator. Well, that's a good good point. Around. You know, keep your cap off and see yeah. if you have flow. Yeah. Because it, it should flow. You should see it pretty easily. Yeah, you shouldn't be able to. If yeah. your head gaskets aren't right, you're not going to have very good yeah, flow. Yeah, if you don't have flow, then that may be indicate inside the engine, yeah. like you said. Yeah. All right. Well, well, Stuart, hopefully we gave you a few things to, to look at. Uh, you know, check back, with, check back in with us next month. You know, like I said, I, I wouldn't be afraid. You don't have any kind of shrouding on it currently you probably want to look at some uh it it does make a difference uh and then you know Especially check idle. yeah and and check Especially check some of the other things that we've talked about too um okay tom asks he has a 1956 old um it it at minus 30 degrees celsius which would be uh close to, close, to, close to our temperature here tonight <laughs> um, I, i'm getting water and carbon freezing inside the choke i replaced the manifold choke pipe yeah. with a stainless steel pipe this summer where's the moisture coming in Okay, I'm getting water and carbon freezing inside my choke. It, it is probably you're, just condensation yeah, from the condensation. engine heating up. Um, yep. Replace the manifold choke pipe with a stainless steel pipe. All right, this summer. Yeah, I, I you know, it's still the the choke pipe is going to. Uh, you know, you're still taking in air from outside mm -hmm. because it it just the way that works, the heat riser works. It, it heats up and then, you know, it, so there would be moisture condensation there. Um, that should burn off though, wouldn't it? But it would, yeah, it would, but I imagine it's, first, my, my first thought, Tom, is why are you running your 56 olds when it's this <laughs> darn cold outside? I kind of agree. <laughs> I'm not going to make plenty of time. I, I kind of appreciate the fact that it is being driven. Uh, but yeah, I, you know, why, you know, if he, if it's a continual issue, why is he having, why is he getting the moisture? My, my initial thought would be, my initial thought is still, yeah, it's just condensation from something. I don't believe in, you know, and I'm, yeah, I'm, not what you know. I know how most choke tubes are. I don't uh, heat riser tubes for the choke. No, fifty six. You know, some some go through the exhaust or does it go through the. Manifold? I don't know. It, yeah, it's, oh, the crossover into the crossover. That's what I'm wondering. Yeah, some yeah, but they're not exposed. So, yeah, some go in the crossover on top of the intake manifold. Yeah. Some go, you know, some come off of the exhaust manifold right. themselves. Right. Um, I wouldn't know if that was like that. You wouldn't get carbon, but coming off the manifold, mostly it's going. Yeah, on. if you you might have to help us out here. Where is your heat riser tube coming off of the exhaust manifold, or the heat riser on intake. the intake manifold? It may be that the tube itself is compromised. That's what I was thinking. Because it's getting more than just heat. If there's carbon in there, then he's getting exhaust in yeah. there. So I would think that the heat riser tube, mm -hmm. something where it's pulling its heat from, whether it, the heat riser tube is, you know, like the 57 DeSoto, the tube runs across the entire exhaust manifold, uh, inside the exhaust manifold, actually. So if that tube compromised, then it lets exhaust into yeah. the choke mechanism. And I suspect this may be what's happening with yeah. yours regardless whether it's coming off the exhaust manifold or coming off the intake manifold where there's sometimes a tube that drops down inside mm -hmm. of the crossover, the exhaust crossover inside the intake. Uh, 
That would be my guess, is, is in either place, either in the exhaust manifold or in the heat uh, off the intake, that is compromised somehow because you shouldn't be getting carbon in there unless there's an exhaust leak itself. And you should not have exhaust gases going into that tube. That merely is supposed to be the heat from the exhaust heating up the air going through that tube. Are we in agreement? I agree. I mean, I, agree. I mean, that's the only two kinds I know of. So, I mean, yeah. if you're getting carbon in there, either it's, you know, you've got to have a leak somewhere on that pipe. So just take a vacuum pump and maybe check and connect it somehow on that pipe and see if you got, if it holds vacuum. Yeah, well, uh, I know on this car it would be impossible to do that because the tube here on this one, it's easy enough to look at because you can just take the exhaust and hold it off and yeah. look inside of it. And like this one was... This one was broke off and I did, all right, it was broke off inside. I did actually find an NOS replacement what? tube, <laughs> but uh, when push came to shove, it was easier just to switch the car over to electric choke as opposed to trying to fix the- you Taking the easy way out? Yes, I did. <laughs> <laughs> and it's more reliable, <laughs> but yeah, is what it is. Um, yeah, I would check the check your heat riser tube uh, and make sure that it's not being exhaust compromised. There should not be actual exhaust coming out of your tube. Um, Stuart got back to us about it didn't run previously his car. Oh, all right. So it's hard to say if it overheated. So, uh, Gordy Wright. In regards to the exhaust manifold coating, I use ceramic coat sprayed on, and it worked excellent. Um, and yeah, yeah, a little expensive, but worth it. Um, and I, I have heard of guys using. I didn't know that was a user installed product. Um, uh, there's a company I think based ceramic coat. I thought was based out of Texas. Now I'm gonna really mess that up. And but you know, do your own <laughs> online search. Uh, so Gordy, they must have a user installable coating. Uh, a little expensive, but worth it. Fifty Dodge Power Ring. Nice. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah, and you know there are some coatings out there like that. A lot of times you'll need. You know, uh, I, I know there's some of the some of those coatings where you got to put it in the you know ag again it worked a lot like a uh, powder coating uh, procedure where you got to put it in the oven at 500 degrees or whatever for X number of minutes in order to cure it. Prep the crap. So then you got to find out when your wife's not home and <laughs> <laughs> and how much yeah. time you're going to need to you know it might smell coat it get it in there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So there's there's a, a lot of a lot of front end work involved. You know, maybe you gotta buy your wife a spa day, then you go <laughs> get her out of the house. Okay, get sure. her out of the house for a while, and the next thing you know, you're good. You've got uh, you know a little bit of time to get the the ceramic coat actually cured. Uh, we do have a couple of guys. Come on. We remember we're trying to stump Terry, so I'm sure you guys have some painting. Should be too hard. Come on. <laughs> so, so we're we're the challenge. We're still like trying to stump Terry. Uh, so give him your best shot tonight. So feel free. Give him your best painting question now. The uh, we had another another gentleman write in. He says he has a 1954 Chevy 3100 pickup. Uh, he has power disc brake, and he, uh, he wants to, uh, he wants to upgrade his 30, his fifty four Chevy thirty one hundred pickup to power disc front brakes. He says some kits he sees they uh, can't be used on vehicles with manual transmissions. Uh, I see. I also see the comment. Uh, I also see the comment with dual master cylinders. I, I can't imagine why a dual master cylinder couldn't be used with a manual tr transmission or even power brakes. I mean, that, that, um, what are my options uh, for a manual transmission? And I suspect um, for 54 Chevy 3100, the factory master was located 
under the floorboard. And I suspect some kits, if you want to add power under there, there's probably limited space yeah. for the for the master and the that booster. And there may not be room for clutch linkage and all of that too. So I, that, you know, because there's no real reason why you can't put power brakes on a manual transmission car or even a dual reservoir master cylinder. But I suspect it becomes down to a matter of space. Uh, your car, your truck is popular enough that uh, there's tons of brake kits out there, tons to choose from. You can go with a hanging pedal and um, get your get all that stuff out from underneath, you know, because it's it's a pain to service the master cylinder underneath the car, anyways. Uh, it's a pain to check fluid. It's a pain to do anything with it. And besides, you've got you know, uh, you got your clutch linkage and all that stuff down there you've got your exhaust that you're probably going to be running through there there's enough stuff going on in that area anyways move it up you know unless you're diehard one you know, race to, you know i i assume you're not a diehard restoration guy because you do want to switch it to power brakes you do want to switch it to a dual reservoir and that's a good safety issue so i suspect you know i i would move if it was my truck i would move it up onto the firewall switch out the, you know, the underfloor pedal for, you know, they do make a hanging pedal for that car that you can mount underneath your dash and you'll have all the convenience of a newer brake system without having to try to fit everything underneath the car. Yeah. The, uh, uh, we have another gentleman here who writes, I, uh, Tim Wright, he has a 1947 flathead V8. Uh, for, that'd be a Ford, I imagine. What type of oil should I use? The motor hasn't run in 40 plus years. New oil would help. <laughs> um, if you can get it turned over. <laughs> the, uh, well, I suspect he can get it. If he can, uh, uh, yeah, I, I suspect he can turn it over. Uh, a lot of flatty guys like heavyweight oils. There's a 1040, the 2050 racing oils with their high end zinc. You want to use any old, old motor like that. You want to use a real high zinc oil. You don't want to use a modern oil. Um, the, the high zinc, the high zinc gives it more, uh, Saves the cam, mm -hmm. keeps the cam from scrubbing and keeps you from wiping out all your lifters and your camshaft and everything else. So it's a good idea in high zinc, heavyweight oils work yeah. best in those from what I've heard. Uh, I know some guys promote non-detergent over detergent. So non-detergents are usually straight weight oils like the yeah. you know 30 weights and 40 weights and stuff like that. So where's the best sort of source of zinc and oils I, it's become less and less so what's a good you know like a valvoline 2050 racing oil the vr, the VR, VR one yeah, is a high yeah, zinc two, oil two. how about uh, some diesel oils is that uh, uh diesel they finally had yeah, diesel diesels for diesel oils for a long time rotella was like always like good go-to because it, you know the diesel oils had a lot a lot more zinc yeah. than even yeah. car, car uh uh oils had in them but now they've started to pull out some of those in some of the newer grades of diesel oils they started to pull the zincs and stuff mm -hmm. out of them again mm -hmm. uh again it comes down to you know the reason they pulled the zinc out of oil, oils in the first place came down to uh, emission stuff where it was you know it would like destroy catalytic converters and stuff like that so it, it was a good thing when it lasted, but, you know, there's still ways around it. There are added, you can still add zinc at a ZDT mm -hmm. yeah. or ZD or whatever. I'll, I'll mess that up too. But there, there's some zinc additives you can add to your oil as well as there's still some, you know, because we still have classic cars, there's still a ton of zinc, high zinc oils on the market. Uh, uh, 
it's just a matter, you know, you do have to spend a little time. Don't grab, you know, don't go if you're used to running, you know, 20, 50 bellowing, don't run in and just grab the first one. Make sure you're getting something with zinc in it for your older engines. I've seen too many camshafts and stuff yeah. get scrubbed off with a, without enough zinc protection in them. Can we get a response to uh, uh, it says Lucas Hot Rod Oil and Classic. Lucas Hot Rod Oil, yep. That, uh, hot Rod and Classic Oil is high zinc. Yep. Okay. The uh, yeah, there's a number of uh, number of them out there, um, and I think what, what do I use? The I don't know. It's on the ship over there somewhere. The uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, the HR five or, or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and. Uh, it, it's a it's a good oil. It, it does the job. Never had any issues with it. The um, I did see a comparison on that with the uh, uh, engine masters. You ever watch that show? Yeah, they compared it, it, it. it was very high. Um, There's a couple other ones that were high, but uh, as far as high performance stuff, yeah, it was, it was good. You know, some of the high zinc oils, and there's some good oils out there. You know, and and that's like the argument I refuse to get into. Then because uh, you know. There's so many guys that have real strong Personal opinions opinion. about what's the best oil to run in yeah. their car. And, you, you know, there's the AMS oil cult people that like will profess that AMS oil, anything is better than, you know, I've run AMS oil in some of my cars before. Oh, I think AMS oil is good. I think right? it's good oil. I've also run Valvoline and the, the Gibbs stuff and, and a few other, few other brands. Um, I think as long as you're buying a good high quality oil, you're, you're big steps in the right direction, you know, and even, even some of the economy store brand stuff, it's still usually made by like, you know, some of the big oil manufacturers, sure. you're just not paying for the, you know, all their advertising on top of it. So it, uh, you know, uh, use common sense and yeah. get your, get yourself. You know, oil is to me is 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 not a, a big dollar investment compared to what you have into the rest of the yes, car. So, exactly. spending a little extra on a good premium quality oil is just insurance. Even uh, snowmobiling, that's all I use in my sled. You had to bring up snowmobiles. <laughs> all well, right. I mean, I use Amazon injectors. Okay, Ross so got a new snowmobile, and all we've listened to <laughs> You don't want to blow up those motors, you know. It's still expensive. Ross talking about his snowmobile. <laughs> it's winter, you know. What else am I going to talk about? My car's parked. <laughs> okay, what we do in the winter when our uh, classic cars are parked, Ross goes snowmobiling. That's right. Um, the uh, so if you have any snowmobiling questions, feel free to ask yeah. Ross. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> uh, let's see. Do you need? Okay, this is in response. We do have some articles out on uh, some good videos where we've done some Mustang uh, LED headlight and taillight upgrades. Uh, in response, he writes to you this. Uh, uh, gentleman writes, "Do you need to upgrade the wire harness?" or install a relay to use LED headlights. I have a 92 Camaro that could use some brighter lights. No, not on headlights. Not on headlights. Not on, well, yeah, LED lights are brighter, they're yeah. safer, they're more reliable. The brake lights, you need to- And the biggest advantage is they use less electricity. So- Oh, they're great. Yeah. yeah, so you don't, you know, your advantage is you don't need, uh, you know, you can, I've I haven't seen an LED, not only headlights, but taillights or side markers yet that you can't just plug into the factory harness. Um, Other than your brake lights, because they need a. Well, yeah, but you don't need relays or anything relays, no. to run it. You don't, they're not going to draw more power. No. You sometimes need to add a resistor. Exactly. So they function properly. Yes. Or an electronic flasher unit. Mm -hmm. uh, difference between an electronic flasher and a normal flasher. Normal, uh, like a turn signal flasher, it's a bimetal connection in there. And as you turn the, the circuit on, it gets hot, and it, it heats up, and then it opens, and then it cools, and then it closes, and it keeps going on. 
you know, getting hot, cool, hot, cool. That's what causes that clicking noise when you turn on your turn signal. In a, an electronic flasher, it's there's no bimetal connection there. It's just you're turning out a timer, a timer that says, you know, a fraction of a second on and a fraction, you know, fraction of a second off. So it's, it's, it becomes a solid state kind of deal. So it's not reliant on a certain amount of resistance to create heat in the flasher unit. So that's the, the mechanical difference of what's going on on a flasher and an LED system. But to answer your question, <clears throat> no, you don't need to make any changes to your wiring harness or add relays for LED lights. Hmm. Oh, I hear it here. I, this is a question I answered before, guys. This guy had an immediate issue. I'm going to like stump you guys with this one. We'll finish up with this. Okay. <laughs> this gentleman wrote, my brother and I replaced the camshaft and timing gears in our Ford 400 cubic inch small block. We were very careful to torque the bolts to spec and even used Loctite on the bolts. After putting it all back together, the motor ran fine. We took the truck out for several test drives and made a few adjustments. Then the motor stalled and wouldn't start. When we took it apart, the camshaft bolt was loose and the timing gear pin on the camshaft was broken off. We we're very careful about torquing all the bolts, so we're perplexed as to how this might have happened. We did, uh, did we just screw up when we torqued the camshaft bolt, or could something else have caused the failure? And that's the camshaft, the, the upper timing, or the camshaft, um, camshaft gear, gear on a Ford has a separate pin to position it. <coughs> That run the oil pump? Mm-hmm. Both. I checked the oil pump. Don't look at me. <laughs> Say anything about <laughs> you know, yours runs the oil pump, right? Uh no, fuel pump. Mm -hmm. Off your cam, off your distributor. No, you probably run fuel. Fuel the pumps off pump. the front of the cam, off a, off a cam on the cam, the front oh, of the gear, okay. and oil pumps off the distributor. The, the distributor the doesn't yeah. run. Mm -hmm. No, the distributor runs the oil pump. Oh, yeah. On the back of the cam, but not oh, the front. So. But his is bolt. His runs. Anyways, yeah. he replied back after I had sent him a response. Well, what did you and respond? he wrote, Mark was correct. What would you respond? The oil pump. I wrote that the oil pump is probably seized. Because oh. in order for that to shear the pin. Yeah, and it stops. stops. And in order for it to shear the pin on the camshaft sprocket, it, the camshaft had to stop. Yeah. yeah. And what's going to stop the camshaft? You know, you can get resistance from lifters and stuff like that, but what's going to stop it? Oil pump freezing up. Oil pump freezes up. It stops the camshaft cold. And then, you know, it'll turn for a little bit until the engine RPM stop. But it'll snap that pin right off that uh, gear. Yeah, and then your timing's gone. And then your timing's gone. You got to worry about interference if your valves have the interference with the pistons. If they're open when the pistons come up, no. But his chain didn't break. His oil pump broke. Right. So but wherever just, those valves were, the crank kept going because that's what caused the the cam when the cam locked up. It snapped the pin on that camshaft, and because the oh, engine was still rotating, it didn't. Snap the pin. <coughs> it the... did snap the pin. Wow. On the, on the, the oil the cam, pump on that? the camshaft. Yeah. I would think it would have just sheared that. I have seen this happen once before, and it was like, I was like, oh, and it's a Ford 400 too. And it was like, as soon as I heard it, it was oh, like, really? bam. I know exactly where that happened. It was the oil pump was seized up. Wow. 
So Ross, you get a smiley face, I guess. Yep. You, yeah, you. Ding ding ding! You Ross something. wins the chest. <laughs> yeah. Well, I know it's a Ford thing. I know a guy was out at drag strip and he had a little light, you know, mm -hmm. that showed as soon as he pressure? lost oil pressure. The second he lost oil pressure. Yeah. Big like shift light, and he did it, and boom, motor, you know, what? Yeah, usually, yeah, usually when the, once the oil pump seizes, anyways, they don't usually run very long right, because right. or it went out. I don't know. Yeah. Hmm. Well, guys, we're at the top of the hour. Uh, I want to thank everybody for coming out tonight. Again, there's a right below the box, the discussion box here. There is free download for you know a, a nice. Uh, uh, article on troubleshooting hard brake pedal you know we built that in association with our good friends at master power brakes um good article go ahead and and you know click on that you can get that free download some good information there to help you out if you ever run into those issues uh want to thank everybody for coming out tonight it you know once again you know you guys floor us with all the good questions um Anything else, guys? I think it stopped. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Next time, make sure we get our good painting. <laughs> and it's coming now, out. isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> and and we'll work harder next time at Stump and Terrier. Remember that. So that, that's the mission going forward. Great. Uh, thanks, guys, <laughs> for coming up. Appreciate it. We'll see you again next month.